In February 1937, President Franklin D. Roosevelt submitted a plan to Congress for increasing the number of Supreme Court justices from nine to as many as fifteen. His proposal ignited a political powder keg that would burn into the heat of summer. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office on March 4, 1933, he inherited a nation in distress. Industrial production was down almost 50 percent. Prices and wages had fallen to disastrous levels, and nearly one-third of the labor force was out of work. It was the Great Depression. Hoping to bring America out of its economic tailspin, FDR began proposing new governmental regulations on local and interstate commerce. He championed measures to limit work hours and set minimum wages for labor. His Agricultural Adjustment Act was designed to raise produce prices by subsidizing farmers not to grow as many crops. Congress swiftly enacted Roosevelt's recovery initiatives collectively called the New Deal, and sent relief to many in need. The Supreme Court of the United States soon invalidated many of the President's New Deal measures as unconstitutional. No Supreme Court had ever struck down so many laws so quickly. An adamantly conservative block of justices known as the Four Horsemen, consistently held that governmental regulation of commerce and labor infringed on personal liberties. They held that Roosevelt's reforms restricted an individual's right to form contracts in violation of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. On a nine-man court, the Four Horsemen only needed one more vote for a majority. Justice Owen Roberts almost always voted with them. Often so did Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes. As measure after measure was revoked, including a popular minimum wage law from New York State protecting women and children workers, FDR realized that his New Deal was no match for an old court. Franklin D. Roosevelt won a landslide re-election in 1936. To him, this confirmed that depression-weary Americans wanted his initiatives declared constitutional. But the judiciary branch stood in the way. So, on February 5, 1937, FDR boldly asked Congress for the authority to reform the Supreme Court. He proposed a plan to appoint an additional justice for everyone not retired by age 70. This would allow him to promptly handpick as many as six new judges for the bench. The president argued that the aging court needed more justices to help with its caseload because he said its members were slow and infirm and behind in their work. But no one doubted his true agenda. Enlarging the court from nine to as many as fifteen would effectively outnumber the conservatives on the bench and dilute their power. Yet FDR carefully pointed out that this was not the first time a president had sought to change the number of Supreme Court justices. Indeed, the Constitution says nothing about the size of the court, leaving that decision for Congress to determine. Congress originally fixed the number of Supreme Court justices at six. Then it gradually added new seats to the Supreme Court as the country expanded westward. There needed to be enough Supreme Court justices to preside over the new judicial circuits because Congress did not provide salaries for circuit judges until 1869, and the justices did double duty. In 1807, a seventh Supreme Court seat was added to represent Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee. In 1837, 
Congress added two new justices and two new judicial circuits. A tenth seat was added in 1863 to cover the West Coast. But in 1866, Congress sought to gradually reduce the court's size to seven by forbidding replacement appointments when justices departed. The intent was to give judges much-needed salary raises and to deny President Andrew Johnson the chance to appoint Southern sympathizers to the court. Finally, in 1869, Congress fixed the size of the court at nine. The Supreme Court, which was not at all behind on its docket, was insulted by the Roosevelt administration's proposal. Chief Justice Hughes fought back. He wrote a letter to the Senate Judiciary Committee assuring them that the court was fully abreast of its work and that there was no congestion of cases on its calendar. Hughes complained that the enlargement plan would be inefficient, with more judges to hear, more judges to confer, more judges to discuss, more judges to be convinced and to decide. Even the liberal block of justices opposed the court enlargement plan. To stem criticism, Roosevelt told the public in a radio fireside chat that he was not trying to pack the court with partisan judges. That plan has two chief purposes. By bringing into the judicial system a steady and continuing stream of new and younger blood, I hope first to make the administration of all federal justice from the bottom to the top speedier and therefore less costly. Secondly, to bring to the decision of social and economic problems younger men who have had personal experience and contact with modern facts and circumstances under which average men have to live and work. This plan will save our national constitution from hardening of the judicial artery. Meanwhile, impressed by FDR's landslide victory and concerned that Congress, with its large Democratic majority, would enact his court proposal, two justices unexpectedly voted to uphold New Deal initiatives. Thus, on March 29th, the court dramatically reversed itself in upholding the legality of a Washington state minimum wage law for women. Justice Roberts switched his vote from a very similar case from New York decided less than a year before. Writing the opinion in the case, Chief Justice Hughes said that the due process clauses of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments require the protection of the law against the evils which menace the health, safety, morals, and welfare of the people. Two weeks later, Hughes and Roberts cast their votes in a landmark case, ruling that federal regulation of labor relations was constitutional. Other rulings in the spring of 1937 showed the Supreme Court turning around its stance on New Deal initiatives, including upholding the Social Security Act. It was joked how a switch in time saved nine. But if this switch was a tactic to get the president to drop his petition for judicial reform, then it failed. FDR still wanted his six new justices. In May, Justice Van Devanter, one of the conservatives, announced his retirement. Congress had quietly passed a law allowing Supreme Court justices to retire and continue to receive their full salary, just as lower court judges did. The old conservative bloc had irretrievably lost its leverage. Still, Roosevelt did not stop pushing Congress to enact a plan for enlarging the court and his obstinacy made him a target for criticism. A scathing Senate Judiciary Committee report released in June said that FDR's court bill should be so emphatically rejected that its parallel will never again be presented to the free representatives of the free people of America. 
Of the ten senators who signed the report, seven were Democrats. Montana's Burton K. Wheeler. You can say that the privilege of appointing postmasters will not be accorded to me. You can say that I'll get no more projects for my state. You can say what you please, but I say to you and to Mr. Farley and to everybody else that I will vote against this proposition because it is morally wrong, it is morally unsound, it is a dangerous proceeding. Detractors made much of this dissension within the president's own party. To heal the rift, Roosevelt invited all 407 Democratic congressmen, including the signers of the report, to a weekend of fun and games on Jefferson Island in the Chesapeake Bay. It was a brilliant move. After three days of relaxed camaraderie, many were willing to reconsider the president's proposal. To capitalize on this momentum, the Roosevelt administration revised the bill to authorize the president to gradually appoint one justice per calendar year for each member of the court who had reached the age of 75. This would allow him four appointees plus a fifth to fill Van Deventer's open seat. The great debate on the court enlargement bill finally opened on the Senate floor in July 1937. Senate Majority Leader Joe Robinson of Arkansas led the fight for enacting it. He had helped power many of the New Deal laws through the Senate and was known as Scrappy Joe for his talent for strong-arming his colleagues. Senator Wheeler, the liberal Democrat from Montana, led the fight for defeating it. But both sides faced a common foe. Washington sweltered in the grip of a killer heat wave, and the congressmen were condemned to argue in an un-air-conditioned chamber. Senator Robinson opened the proceedings with a two-hour-long speech. He had enough promised votes to pass the court bill, but he wanted a clear two-thirds majority to avoid a filibuster. He knew his best tactic would be to make the debate into an endurance contest. One-third of the senators were over 60 and in no condition to stew in a hot room. Robinson went long rounds with his opposition, bellowing and stamping his feet like an enraged bull. But strain clearly showed on his reddened face and in the stoop of his shoulders as he fended off assaults to the bill. His trademark vigor flagged, and when he returned to his apartment that night, he died from the heat and stress. The great debate was not yet over, but without Senator Robinson's aggressive advocacy, FDR's judiciary bill was doomed. Senators who had been only tenuously committed to the plan switched their loyalties, giving the opposition forces an absolute majority for the first time. At Senator Wheeler's insistence, the measure was put to a vote right away. No concessions were made to spare embarrassment to the administration or its supporters. And so, on July 22, 1937, after 168 days, President Roosevelt's plan for enlarging the Supreme Court was defeated. Senator Hiram Johnson, a Republican from California, summed it up for many when he cried out in Congress, Glory be to God! FDR would go on to appoint eight Supreme Court justices as vacancies opened during his twelve years in office. They would transform the judiciary into a critical partner in implementing the New Deal. But his failed court-packing campaign marked the last time a president asked Congress to change the number of seats on the Supreme Court. <laughs>